tell me something about the difficulties of uh, or important fields of information retrieval that you think might be relevant to current um, storage of huge amounts of information on the web and uh, elsewhere? Well, uh, as you know from your own work, uh, this is a, a very challenging field because uh, if, you, if you know the categories beforehand, um, you can organize a hierarchy and if people know what they're looking for, it's, it's not too a difficult problem. But most of the really interesting things that we're interested in, we, we, we don't know uh, the, um, the precise hierarchy or, or what we're looking for. And I, I consider this problem one of the most fundamental problems of intelligence full stop, because uh, if one thinks about how a child uh, learns about the world, uh, it's, it's a similar problem. Uh, they've got a problem that there's a huge amount of information that they absorb in the first few years of their lives. And how is it that they come up with structures which, at least for a particular culture, are very similar to, to the ones that uh, everybody else has? And um, I first came across this problem uh, reading a... We had an Arbeitskreis in, in, in Vienna. It's one of the nice cultural aspects of Viennese uh, intellectual life. Uh, amongst us uh, students in physics and mathematics, and we chose a book by Rudolf Carnap called The Logische Aufbau der Welt, The Logical Construction of the World. And the thing that impressed me so much at the time is that he started with a single concept, the concept of Ähnlichkeitserinnerung, the, the uh, loosely translated the recollection of similarities. And starting with that single concept, he showed in his book how you can build up all the other concepts uh, that we have in, in our language, just basically by by uh, by set theory. He, mm -hmm. of course, they were all. The, the, he was part of the Vienna, uh, the, the Vienna Kreis, the Vienna Circle, and set theory had just been in, uh, invented. So he, he went through this in, in quite a, a tedious way using set theory. Uh, but uh, we we now know that that, that Bayesian uh, probabilities is probably a, a, a much more um, elegant way of approaching it uh, and one of the things that I would like to do sometime in the future is to see if we could build a computer that is a, prob a probabilistic computer rather than a, a traditional microprocessor and uh, I hope to uh, put together a, a group of people that help me think about it of course including Steve Herber again and Steve Young who's uh, been working on, on speech recognition and that's all probabilistic hidden Markov chains, and, and we've got a great knowledge uh, of, of uh, a great a wealth of people who know about Bayesian arithmetic. Our, our most valuable company in Cambridge now, Autonomy, run by Mike Lynch, of course, is all based on Bayesian, uh, um, Bayesian principles, and we have a very strong group in the engineering lab on that. And, and I really think this is just such a, um, a fundamental problem, possibly the most fundamental problem of intelligence that I'd, I'd like to, uh, hmm. to do more work on. It. Let's uh, come back to, um, and you must be now uh, in our story, this is about 1981, 82. Yes. What, what happened after um, Olivetti? That was uh, 85. Five, that's right. Uh, well, I became uh, Vice President of Research for, uh, for Olivetti uh, and we actually moved to Italy, to Ivrea. My first daughter was born here in Cambridge, but during the time that we were uh, in Italy. Um, and I had seven research laboratories all over the world. It was just a wonderful time uh, to get to know how a large company works. Uh, that's what... Um, um, uh, the guy who ran Logica at the time, oh, yeah. Philip Hughes. Hmm. I went to Philip and said, Philip, uh, I've had this offer from, uh, to be a vice president of research for Olivetti. Uh, should I take the job or not? And he said, what do you really want to do? I said, long term, I probably want to do another company. I'm a small company man, really. He says, go take that job at Olivetti. You'll find out how big companies work. You'll be much better in small companies. <laughs> and this was absolutely the right advice. Hmm. Mm. I, I, these, were, these were three, three and a half years. I was, I was there three and a half of the best years in my life, uh, because they, they treated me very well there. I, 
I had great freedom uh, to do research for Olivetti. I set up the Olivetti Research Lab with Andy mm -hmm. here, um, uh, and uh, and we could do wonderfully innovative things all over the world. I had uh, one in Palo Alto, uh, one in Bari, one in Pisa, one in Milano, one in Ibrea, one in Triumphadel in Germany, in Nuremberg, and of course the one in, in Cambridge, which actually was by far the most successful. Was it? Mm. Well, that might be a point at which to insert the question about this, the development of the Cambridge phenomenon and silicon fan stuff. Yeah. I mean, why was it most successful and is this related to something wider about the Cambridge environment? I, I think it is. Uh, I think it's part of the... Um, Alfred Marshall, the uh, teacher of, uh, of Maynard Keynes, mm did an interesting study on clusters in Manchester around the um, textile industry. And he famously said that this, this, this knowledge about how to do textiles was, as it were, in the air. Because people would talk about it in the pubs, they, they, they just taught each other, uh, people would move from one mill to the other, as if there was an innovation uh, in one mill, it would soon, soon spread to the, uh, to the rest of the environment. And in, in Cambridge we've had a few seminal companies like uh, 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 Cambridge Instruments, Sinclair Radionics and, and Acorn and, and CCL that sort of became the, uh, uh, the company that um, set the gene pool, if you like. And uh, we, the, the, the Judge Institute did some very nice uh, work on uh, the relationship of the companies that have been formed uh, over the last 20 years and the original company that they worked for. And I think Acorn now is responsible, or Acorn alumni are responsible for over 100 companies in the, oh. in the Cambridge area. Uh, uh, so in many ways, Cambridge um, Acorn plays a similar role in Cambridge that Fairchild played in Silicon Valley, because mm. all the big semiconductor companies in, in, in the Valley are fair children, so mm -hmm. it's all uh, at the Psylogic mm. uh, National role, founded by alumni of, uh, um, of that child. I mean, the, the obvious uh, interpretation is that if you have a very high-level scientific university with a lot of very good graduates and teachers who are allowed the freedom to um, go out of their work or alongside their work, engage in... Um, applied science and given some incentives that will be a very good atmosphere but that must be true of quite a lot of universities in no, the it's world. not i think that's one of the things that really distinguishes uh, uh, cambridge from at least other european universities and sadly because of the the obsession with conflicts of interest in the united states also the us yeah. uh, there is there is such a an obsession with this uh, conflict of interest mm. that, that it's, it becomes increasingly difficult for professors at American universities to do the obvious thing, mm. which is when, it's, when, it's, uh, when there is a conflict of interest but it is not material mm. or it's not important, get on with it, you know, mm. help the company, help mm. it grow. Mm. Uh, and if it does become material, then you know, you, you, first of all you declare it, you're very open about it and then you have rules about how to deal with it. Mm. But uh, because there is, uh, America is such a litigious uh, society, uh, this is becoming a real problem over there. Over here, uh, Roger Needham was a classic example of somebody who, uh, from personal experience, was unbelievably helpful to Acorn computers in the early days. Mm. Uh, he allowed us to, um, uh, to employ people in the computer lab on a, well, on a consultancy basis. Uh, he. Uh, in fact, the, some of the chips in the BBC Micro uh, were, were developed in the computer lab uh, by, uh, by people who, uh, who were lecturers and they were, they were consulting for, um, uh, for Acorn at the time. And of course he also allowed his, uh, his students to be fed uh, Fitzpilly buns at, uh, <laughs> at, uh, at Acorn at four o'clock <laughs> and spent a bit of time with us. Uh, and then, you know, he would, uh, he would come to me and said, Herman, uh, we've got a bit of a problem in, uh, in the computer lab. You clearly have benefited from uh, the relationship with the computer lab. 
uh, you know, we've we've set up a, basically a slush fund mm. uh, that we need we need a bit of money or so. Um, how about it? You know, mm. would you like to contribute to that? Well, of course, we did. <laughs> So it was it was totally informal, mm. uh, but I think both the computer lab and Acorn uh, benefited from that at that time in a very uh, informal way, just because people trusted each other. Uh, in the meantime, it's become a little bit more formalized, but it needed to because the stakes are higher, the companies are bigger, and, and of course the contracts need to be more more precise. But but there is still a willingness on on both sides to to be supportive mm. of each other. And sadly, especially many continental universities don't do that. They mm. they, they just have a uh, an aversion to, to, to work with business. Mm. I was talking to a, someone called John Wood, who is um, on the European um, Region Initiative and, and a head of engineering, I think, uh, at Imperial College. And he said that there's been a sudden recent big shift in particularly this aspect in China, that until about a year or two ago there was a big firewall between universities and startup companies and they've mm -hmm. taken this down and they, there's been an explosion. There is an explosion occurring in Shanghai, particularly Jiao Tong University. Isn't that nice? Mm -hmm. Oh, that's good to hear. I haven't, I haven't heard that. <coughs> um, but I've also heard another thing I wondered whether I've, one or two of the interviewers, uh, interviews, I think, um, have m mentioned an apprehension that um, the university here is, as the number of, well, maybe related to the increasing bureaucracy numbers of administrators, uh, desire to try and free up funds for the university, they are showing a greater interest and d desire to uh, somehow make a little bit more money out of these startup companies, and um, so intellectual property rights are now being scrutinised more carefully. And whoever it was who told me this said that they were worried that this might tend to stifle um, what has been a very productive relationship. Yes, well, there has been a, a great debate a few years ago about IPR, mm -hmm. and um, I think the most important thing is that the university decided on clear rules on how to do this because there were no clear rules before. And one of, the, one of the problems that we had before was that you couldn't actually go to the university and say, <clears throat> could I please pay for this IPR, base a company on it and go and do mm. it? Because they didn't know mm. who the IPR belonged to and mm. they couldn't uh, give you, they could neither say, I give you a license to this IPR because I own it, mm. or say, no, I don't own this PR, IPR, go do it. The only thing they could say is, we don't know. <laughs> that was not very helpful to base a company on. So mm. that particular problem was, was, was solved. So there are now clear rules. Um, the other thing that I think has, has happened for the better is that, that this clear rule set is now being implemented by a subsidiary of the university called Cambridge Enterprises. And I think we've been quite lucky in the person that uh, who was hired to head up uh, Cambridge Enterprises, it's Terry Willey, uh, because she had done a similar job for Chicago University, and she actually spun out as a uh, spun out a group into um, a uh, venture capital firm that did that for Chicago, and she has a personality that that fits into the Cambridge, uh, uh, that, that, that I, I think is non-confrontational. Mm. Uh, and my hope is that this actually will lead to more spin-outs uh, mm. uh, than in the past. But it is true, there are more rules and it's more regimented than it was before. You mentioned uh, Cambridge in relation to the continent. What about Cambridge in relation to other British universities? I mean. Oxford seems to have quite a successful sound spark. And yes, sound. and so does uh, Imperial. Uh, so Cambridge is 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 an outlier as mm. it, as it often is in its uh, uh, in its rule set. Uh, the IPR arrangements in Cambridge are the most generous in mm. Europe, I think, mm. and more generous than Imperial and and Oxford. And uh, I think that's a good thing. Mm. I'm surprised about America because one. I mean, being up Silicon Valley and seeing how close it is to Berkeley and Sanford, yes. I'd always assumed that, that it was quite, there was quite a lot of movement between those universities and 
Silicon Valley. There is, there is an enormous movement, but their IPR arrangements are much tighter than the IPR arrangements here in, mm -hmm. in Cambridge. Mm. However, there are one or two universities uh, in, in America, and it's an interesting experiment, um, who say there's the the Doyle Act, the Doyle Something Act in, in America, that said all the uh, all the funding that uh, American universities um, receive, all the research that's funded by uh, uh, federal funds or state funds, uh, if any IPR is generated through these funds, that IPR belongs to the university. Um, that was a famous act. And most uh, universities uh, do that. But some, uh, one or two exceptions that say, no, it's free for anybody to use. And it's an interesting experiment because, uh, as far as I can see, there is not, not, not much difference between <laughs> the, uh, uh, the number of spin outs and the, mm. the exploitation. So both work. Just, just continuing on, on these spin outs and your role um, in this, I, I was amazed to see a, a diagram of the, um, a kind of network analysis mm -hmm. of the different companies. There was a picture of you, and there was they'd done sort of coloured uh, weightings of the different um, sets of relationships, and you appeared like some mafia boss to be um, there in almost many more kinds of link and relationship to many of these things than than anyone else. How how do you account for that? Your position in. Well, I, I don't know. I, I didn't set out to uh, have all these relationships. They mm. just happened mm. uh, over the years. Mm. I suppose it's um, partially because of, uh, of Acorn Computers. So mm. many of the, of the companies spun out from Acorn Computers. And partially because uh, uh, during the um, 80s and 90s, when there wasn't really a lot of venture capital around, um, I suppose I was about 50% of the business angel money in, in Cambridge, so uh, they knew I was a sucker for technology and if they came to me with a, an interesting project, mm. I would uh, I would try my best to um, either fund it myself or, or find them funding and uh, I was always happy to, um, to talk to people even if I didn't fund or didn't uh, uh, manage to, to, to raise funds for them because I'm always interested in, in, in new projects and, and new technology. Mm. So I suppose that's how these uh, relationships came about. Well, one of the things that I think, if I remember it rightly, you set up was a venture capital uh, fund, Amadeus. Yes. Um, can you tell, tell in, me something about in, that? In 97. Uh, that was uh, founded by, well, it, it's, 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 it's interesting uh, to um, remember why we started uh, uh, Amadeus. It was at the time when people did not believe in technology uh, venture capital, especially not in Europe. Uh, and interestingly, we, all the money we got, we got from America, not Europe. So mm. the Americans believed in European technology funds <laughs> before the Europeans mm. did. Now most of the fund comes mm. from European pension funds, etc. Uh, and people just didn't believe that there was enough deal flow. But I knew there was enough deal flow because I had so much deal flow personally that I couldn't cope with the, mm. with the number of uh, projects anymore. And that's why I felt uh, it was time to start a, a venture fund. One of the other people on these diagrams is uh, Richard Friend, who I've interviewed and talked to. Um, and he was telling me about um, uh, electronic paper or yes. whatever. Can you tell me something about that development? Because I gather you raised a, a, a very large sum venture capital support to support? Uh, yes, we did. It's the largest uh, venture capital round ever raised uh, in Europe. We raised over 200 million for uh, Plastic Logic, which is the company mm -hmm. um, I founded with, uh, uh, with Richard Friend. And uh, we've actually built the world's first uh, electronic um, uh, uh, plastic electronics factory in the world in, in Dresden, in East Germany. Uh, which will be opened on the 17th of September. And it's, it's quite a historic uh, event because it will be the first time in 50 years that a new semiconductor goes into mass production. The last semiconductor was silicon. 
So really? practically 100% of the world's transistors are made on silicon. And here is, is, is a new one uh, made out of plastic and it came out of the, the Cavendish Laboratory uh, where Richard did his PhD, I think just one year after me, we did our PhDs just two doors from each other. Yeah. And, uh, and we have a, a new product which is called an e-reader uh, that I think uh, will change the way people read. It's a new product category. It's a product category between uh, a, a personal computer and a mobile phone. It's clearly lighter and you can hold it in, in, in one hand very easily. Uh, you'll be able to uh, change pages just by touch. It's got a touch interface and uh, it is very paper-like. It's a reflective display, not a, an emissive display like um, laptop displays. And because it's a reflective display and it's bi-stable, it consumes no power at all when you read it. It only consumes power when you change the page, Gosh. which means that you can uh, that, that this unit will have uh, an endurance of probably three weeks, uh, so you can easily go on holiday and read, you know, as much as you uh, like, uh, six or ten books if you like. Yeah. And, mm. and How many books would it hold? I mean, that's it will story. hold hundreds of books. Really? Yes. So you can one... have your whole whole library uh, with you here, actually. Uh, uh, there will be two models. One is probably two gigabytes. The other one is eight gigabytes. The eight gigabyte model will hold um, two million pages. Uh, I'd say two hundred pages of, of novel. Uh, that would be uh, ten thousand books. Mm -hmm. And you can download books to it. Yes. Uh, so you can. It's got three main use cases. Uh, one is e-books, mm -hmm. uh, e-newspapers, and it's the paperless printer. So if you want to print out anything, rather than printing it uh, on paper and destroy the world's forests, you can print it on here because, as I said, you can have two million pages in there <coughs> and, and retrieve it and, uh, and, and use it uh, like that. And it's a, a reading device. People always are very um, emotional about books and they say, what are you doing? You're destroying books by, by uh, having e-books. Well, I'm reading um, Molecular Cell Biology at the moment by, by Lodish, the MIT uh, book on, on cell biology. It's a thousand pages. I read this in bed. It's the most awkward thing to read that you mm. can imagine. It's five kilograms. Yeah. <laughs> All this up here. It's, it's awful. It yeah. is not the right thing to read. It would be much better if a thousand pages were you know, in 300 grams rather than mm. five kilograms. Mm. It's very light as well, you're, you're mentioning. Yeah, it's, uh, it's about 300 grams, so you can easily hold it in one hand. Does it feel like reading a page? I mean, the the, the um, quality. Yes, of it that. does. It has many things in common with uh, with a paper. So one is that it's reflective, and therefore you can read it in any under any lighting conditions. In particular, it's very good in the sunlight, where uh, where personal computers are no good. Uh, the second is that the contrast ratio between black and white is ten to one, mm. and that's exactly the same contrast ratio as paper. Uh, so and because it's by stable, it does not flicker at all. So it's very very steady. So uh, people have a reading experience that's as close to paper as uh, uh, as any display that has ever been invented. I hope it's been patented. Yes, it has. <laughs> we have over seventy. I think it's seventy-two patents. Uh, really? Gosh, amazing. Um, but when I asked Richard about it, he said he didn't think it would replace books. I mean, people like books and no, they will go yeah, on. Of course, yes. But for particular things like newspapers and so on, it would mm -hmm. be extremely helpful. One, uh, just a further thought, you said that you could put print out, which will be extremely good, you can print out all your emails onto it and hold them there. Exactly. But how do you find them? What's the search system on it? If you well, have... you just download it from uh, from your PC, so it has a Bluetooth and a Wi-Fi interface yes. and, and a USB interface. Yeah. So when you connect it to your computer, you will have a shared folder, so anything that's in that shared folder will be synced uh, out onto the uh, e-reader, the plastic e-reader. So, But you wouldn't be able to search it on the e-reader very easily? Uh, there is a search function on the e-reader as well, and you bring up... Uh, this is a touch interface, so you bring up a keyboard there and you type in the, uh, the search. Uh, so it will have a keyboard on it as well? It will have a pop-up keyboard, mm. yes. And can you then input things into it? Uh, yes, you can. 
uh, but of course you're typing on a on a pop up keyboard, so it's not something that where you would input a lot uh, a lot but, of text. But you could then, in effect, use it as a computer and type in things and send things. Uh, you can, but that's uh, uh, you know that's not the main uh, the use case. The mo mm. main use case is really a reader. That it's a, mm. an e-reader. If you want to type something, you really want to have a keyboard with moving keys mm. rather than. Uh, it's good enough to be typing the odd word and doing the searches, but I wouldn't recommend writing a book on it. Mm. What, if you had to compare it with, say, the the Amazon ebook reader, the Kindle, yes. um, Kindle, what were the advantages and disadvantages? Well, the main difference is that the Kindle is a six-inch display, which is about uh, uh, this big, mm. and this is an eleven-inch display. The Kindle, however, weighs the same. Uh, as this, although it is a lot smaller. Hmm. And the reason for that is that this is the first implementation of plastic uh, transistors, uh, whereas everybody else has to have glass as the substrate, and we have polyethylene as the substrate. So that's why it can be light and flexible. If you try to produce a display as big as this, this is roughly A4, in glass, it would be very much heavier, and of course it would easily break, whereas mm. this doesn't break, this is, uh, uh, mm. this is flexible. Can you drop it in your bath? Mm. Uh, at the moment it has one USB, which we're also trying to make waterproof, uh, <laughs> so if you put a bung in there, which we will provide you with, uh, you can <laughs> throw it into the pool and it will be all right. <laughs> <laughs> you can float in the pool and read it. Mm. Um, that's absolutely fantastic, I feel I'm on a Okay. It's also a, 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 an incredibly fundamental breakthrough because with, with this um, um, factory that we're opening in, in Dresden in September, it will be the first time that a new semiconductor is going into uh, mass production for 50 years mm. because practically 100% of the uh, transistors at the moment mm. are made out of silicon mm. and here we're making transistors out of plastic. So it's mm. a very, very fundamental breakthrough of uh, Richard Friend's group in the, hmm. in the Canon vision. What about um, their other, the other thing that Richard was talking about, which is their experiments in capturing sunlight? Oh, yes. Well, his group, uh, as you know, has just been unbelievably productive. Hmm. Uh, they first invented uh, polymer uh, OLEDs, uh, um, organic light emitting diodes, and then that went into a company called CDT that I was also involved in, which was now bought by Sumitomo. The second spin out was uh, Plastic Logic with uh, Henning Searinghaus, one of uh, 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 Richard Friend's brilliant students, who is now a professor himself. Mm. He's a Hitachi professor at the Cavendish. And uh, we're now thinking about, uh, or, or Richard is, uh, has a, a wonderful new approach to photovoltaic solar cells. Mm again based on plastics rather than silicon mm. and, uh, and I, I'm very excited about that and maybe we can produce another company, mm. uh, another spin out from the Cavendish around that. As I was talking to Jack Lang, or rather my wife was talking to Jack Lang and she asked him what he thought was the, going to be the most important development in computing and related in technology in the next 10, 20 years. She expected something entirely different but he he mentioned this uh, photovoltaic cells. I think you might well be right, mm. because it's such a such a big problem, this uh, energy problem, and mm. this is such a neat solution because it's a long-term solution. Uh, you know, all the all the other solutions, maybe with the exception of wind, are are, are sort of band aids. Whereas mm. using the uh, uh, the sun has been the provider of energy on Earth for the past four and a half billion years. Mm. It's, a, it's a wise thing to use. Biology mm. works mm. With, it, with it. Why don't we use it? Why Why is it so much better than, say, solar panels and solar? Well, the main uh, reason is uh, cost. Potentially, if we make uh, the same reason why why this is so much cheaper than than liquid crystal displays or how much will they sell for by the way uh, they uh, early on it will be uh, four ninety nine dollars about two hundred pounds mm -hmm. roughly the same as the Kindle uh, but uh, my expectation is that there will be a number of versions smaller versions uh, as well and uh, uh, the price will come down over the years mm -hmm. so the cost of solar panels is very great. The, the cost of uh, um, Richard solar panels, mm. which are based on plastic rather mm. than silicon, mm. are potentially very much lower mm. uh, cost. Uh, 
Um, the, the problem with that approach is that silicon is about 20% efficient now, hmm. and plastic solar cells are 6 or 7% efficient, so we need to get the efficiency up. Hmm. Uh, but people like uh, Richard have, have this wealth of experience uh, in, in the electronic structure of, of polymers hmm. that I have every confidence that they will, uh, will hmm. be able to increase the efficiency rapidly over the next few years. Hmm. I think we've covered a lot of things and you've given me a lot of your time. Are there things that you would like me to ask you about? I mean, we haven't really spoken a great deal about the last um, 15 years of your life. Well, maybe we should just... Uh, um, Tell me something about what you're doing now. And, and or, or, or maybe quickly talk about the Cambridge Network because yes. Um, yes, do that. that has been... Uh, I think a wonderful success uh, when uh, there were six founders of the Cambridge uh, Network. It's the only organization that, that straddles the university and the business community. So the university was one of the six founders of the, uh, of the Cambridge Network and it was set up with an objective of bridging the gap between academia and business community. And it now has over a thousand companies as members uh, all the departments of the university, of course, are members. There are many open lectures uh, that have both academics and business people as, uh, uh, as contributors. And uh, it has a very vibrant uh, website and, uh, and a newsletter. So uh, we didn't expect this to be uh, as successful as it, as it turned out to be when we founded it some 10 years ago now. I suppose it was Alec Brewers who... Mm who helped us with that. Hmm. Um, and what is its main purpose? It's just to generate information flow or...? Uh, well, uh, yes, it's really the information flow between um, academia and the business community and also how uh, Cambridge presents itself to the rest of the world. So. The Cambridge Network has a very close relationship with the Munich Network, with the Shanghai Network, with Stanford, and uh, one or two others. So it's part of a network of networks, if you like. <coughs> it has uh, it runs the corporate gateway, so it, it connects very well to big companies. Kodak came here because of the Cambridge Network. Nokia, I think, came here because of the Cambridge Network. Uh, <coughs> and uh, uh, the other thing that it does, uh, uh, again, an unexpected boon the website is so popular that it's now become the main jobs website so if <laughs> any company wants uh, to hire anybody they put jobs at ad job adverts on the website and that's where people go to look for jobs mm. let's return to you as a young man or as a little boy falling in love with cambridge and wanting to come back here each summer and so on what what is it about cambridge that you've really liked over the years well, in those, in those days, I suppose it was the girls <laughs> and the river. And it was actually King's is one of the reasons why I applied to King's. It was, mm. I spent a lot of time on the back of King's Were you at King's? King's? Yes. I didn't know that. I mean, I know you're an honorary fellow, but... Yes, yes I, I did my PhD here mm. in 73 or 77. Mm. Oh, I was here then. We didn't meet, don't suppose. Um, so the girls and the river. Um, and the river and, and of course, the, uh, uh, the academic environment. Uh, one of the really nice things about Cambridge is that uh, with uh, as an Austrian with a bit of an accent, mm. uh, you're accepted here. Uh, having a you know slightly different cultural background is not considered as something odd, but something interesting. Mm. And so I always felt uh, yeah, yeah, very much at home here. Especially in Kings, where a number of distinguished economists from Central Europe, anyway, Caldor yes. and Kahn and all these people. Mm. Um, do you think the college system yeah. is one of the important fact features of Cambridge? Uh, yes, I do. I, uh, I'm surprised how, how much I identify, when, when people ask me who I identify with or with which organization I identify with in, in, in Cambridge, is really King's because I lived here mm. and I, I, mm. you know, I, I had lots of student friends here and I suppose it's, it's, it's this exposure during very formative years mm. that, that creates this bond. Uh, of course, I'm very proud of our university. I'm, mm. you know, I'm very proud of, of the Cavendish. But the, the the strongest emotional bond is really with the college. Oh, nice. Well, we must have dinner together then. <laughs> <laughs> but are there, are there any fellows of Kings now who you know better than others and have 
remain friends over some years with? Well, Herbert Hubbard, because mm. uh, I suppose mm. he was another physicist I uh, stayed c uh, close to. Um, I had a, a nice relationship with uh, Alan Billsborough, who was oh, my yes. tutor mm. uh, at the time. And, uh, and I was there a tutor for graduate students, wasn't he? Yes, he was. Mm. And uh, there was a time when I thought I wanted to change from, uh, from physics to artificial intelligence, because mm. I went to all the AI conferences at the time, and it was the exciting thing. Uh, at the time, and, and, and he gave me a lot of good advice and introduced me to people to talk to. There was, there was the, the Keith King's Van Rijsbergen and people like this. Did you meet? Um, Keith Van Rijsbergen, did you yes, meet? Yes, yeah. yes, and uh, we had the, the, the King's Research Centre, mm. you remember, where the, a lot of the AI work uh, mm. went there, so he introduced me to people there. It was very helpful, and um, in the end I decided it was much better to finish the PhD mm. and, then, and then do something in computing, which I did. Mm. And uh, of course, he was what was then called a physical anthropologist, and is now called a biological anthropologist. And he married a biological anthropologist. Was Alan a matchmaker? Uh, uh, no, it was um, either Ray Van Dam uh, or Sue Nicholson who uh, who introduced me to Pamela. But I actually, first met Pamela in King's Bar. <laughs> 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 Very King's nice. sort of indirectly was a, a matchmaker, and we got married in the chapel. Did you? Oh, lovely. So, um, is there anything else that I should have asked you about you would like to put on record? Um, well, the, the only uh, maybe final thought that is worth uh, mentioning is um, that uh, over the past 20 years, the, the, the high-tech environment uh, in Cambridge clearly has blossomed enormously and people often ask me what uh, I felt about the next uh, five to ten years and I, I'm really quite optimistic about it. I think many of the building blocks uh, that, that made Silicon Valley so um, enormously successful are finally in place in, in Cambridge. There's never been a problem with technology. We've always mm. had uh, enough technology coming out of Cambridge. There was a real problem with, uh, with management. We just didn't have experienced managers. And uh, we now have uh, many uh, second generation serial entrepreneurs. In fact, mm. a, a very interesting data set is that in Amadeus 1, 17% of the deals we did were serial entrepreneurs. In Amadeus 2, this had risen to 40%. And now in Amadeus 3, it's 70 percent. So it went from 17 mm -hmm. to 17 just 10 years. So there's a lot of, of homegrown talent that we now have that we can work with. And we can also track so some of the best managers from all over the world. So Selexa, our latest billion dollar company, mm -hmm. uh, was uh, grown by a guy called John West who ran a billion dollar operation of, of um, uh, ABI, the lead company in sequencing machines. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we went to him as a, as a little Cambridge startup and said, John, uh, we have uh, bad news and good news for you. The, the bad news is we have a machine here that is 100 times better than the one that you're selling. We're going to blow you out of the water. Mm. And the good news is we want you to do it. <laughs> and he saw this. He looked at it. He's a you know, physicist. Uh, he, he understands the technology. And he said, yeah, you're going to do this and I better do it for you. <laughs> That's a lovely story. <laughs> and for and for Plastic Logic, uh, you know, I just hired the most senior person I've ever hired in my life, mm. a guy called Rich Archuleta, who ran a ten billion dollar um, business for HP. Mm. Uh, this is something that we couldn't do ten years ago. Mm. So, so you know, technology we always had, management uh, we've finally well we haven't sorted out. We'd like to do more there, but 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 we now have the ability of having these quality managers. Uh, we finally have technology-based venture capital, like Amadeus, fortunately we're not the only ones, there are, there are quite a few now. There, there are a sufficient number, there's still not enough, but there is a sufficient number to put these uh, syndicates together. And, and there is uh, a local uh, culture now of people who are quite willing to uh, engage in startups. And uh, you know, I talked about uh, Cambridge being a, uh, a low-risk environment to do high-risk things in, so people can dare and join a startup which might have a, a shaky future because if things don't work out there are enough other startups uh, where they can get a job without having to move. So I'm, I'm really 
quite excited about the next five to ten years. And the other criticism that, that people make is uh, there aren't really any more interesting things to do. You know, all the interest in the internet is, is mature now, computers are mature, what else is there to be done? I have never seen more exciting new projects, mm. uh, 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 as many new exciting projects as I'm seeing now. So um, maybe mm. to end on a positive note. Well, um, almost, but there's another question that has yeah. occurred to me, if that you don't mind. As, as you mentioned earlier, China. Yes. Um, I spend quite a lot of time in China and talk to computing scientists there and so on. And it, in some respects, as you know, it's a very, very exciting environment. Yes. And huge um, talent and mm. energy and uh, growth. And yet, some people say it doesn't have the you know, creative abilities and there are various things cycling it. I wondered what you felt about the future of Chinese. I think this will change. Mm. As it has changed in all uh, in all other cultures, is my uh, is my guess. Uh, the belief that uh, you know we can dream it up and they'll they'll build it, mm. I think, is a very short-lived uh, phenomenon. Uh, they clearly don't just do Nike shoes uh, 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 over there. And one early example of that is a company called Huawei. Mm. Huawei produces telecoms equipment. is now one of the largest telecoms equipment companies in the world. Uh, about three or five years ago, they had a huge court case um, that Cisco brought against them because they were copying Cisco kit. Cisco is the leading uh, um, provider of network equipment in the world. Uh, and now, five years later, Cisco uh, uh, hopes to copy what Huawei is doing because the Huawei kit, kit is now ahead of Cisco. Uh, uh, they are actually the innovator now. Cisco is the follow-up. How so do you spell Huawei? Huawei is H U W. E I. And where are they? In the, um, Shanghai? In Beijing? Uh, Shenzhen, Guangdong? I think. Shenzhen. Mm. Yeah. They're probably all over now. But. Mm. Well, that is also an optimistic note. So perhaps on that second optimistic note, thank you very much indeed, Herman. That was fascinating. Well, thank you for having an interest. <laughs>